Well, would you stand with me this morning as we are uh, reading? I'll be reading from Luke 21, beginning in verse 8. <clears throat> and he said, See that no one, uh, see that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is at hand. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified. For these things must first take place before the end, but the end will not be at once. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places famines and pestilences, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this reading of your word. We thank you for the words of the song we just sung. We ask humbly that you will reveal yourself through your word this morning. Uh, we acknowledge, we acknowledge, Father, what is obvious, that we are not in any way uh, deserving or capable of making your word be clear and then flow into the hearts of people. But you are, and so we invite you to do that. I pray that all the distractions that would take our minds away from the, this word for these few moments would be done away. Pray for our missionaries, for those who are far and near. We pray, especially for the Sereds in Israel this morning. And as we hear again, speaking of hard times, the attacks even uh, today in uh, Egypt on uh, Christians, we pray, Father, for your blessing and comfort uh, for the Sereds as they share your gospel in a very difficult place. Thank you for the fruit that they are seeing there. We pray for those who are ill. Lord, it seems like there's just a disproportionate amount of sickness, illness, very serious things among us right at the moment. We pray for your hand of mercy there, for your comfort, for your grace, for your healing power, that in all things your name might be lifted up and glorified. So we pray, and so may it be in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Turn with me, if you're not already there, to the 21st chapter of Luke. You know, as we go through this uh, Olivet Discourse, the, the going is, the sledding is tough. And uh, as much as ever, and maybe more than most, uh, I need you to really put your thinking caps on. I need you to avoid the distractions. You know, if, you're, if your mind is like mine, it goes here and there, and then it comes back on target, and then it goes here and there again. The more you can keep it from going here and there, the better you'll be able to follow because uh, these are some pretty uh, difficult, in a way, things that we go through during these weeks. So please uh, focus as best you can for the moments that we spend here. My, uh, my, my watch has a stopwatch function on it, and uh, so I can start it up and then, you know, push a button and stop it later and get down to the, you know, tenths of a second how much time went by. So one day I did that, I, I don't remember what I was timing, but something, and I got done after a few moments, I pushed the button, I looked down, and lo and behold, it was minus two minutes. I thought, this is great, I'll just keep that up, and I'll move backwards in time. But of course, it was, there was a problem. Don't move backwards in time. Problem was a calibration problem. Instead of starting at zero, it started at minus six minutes. So it had to get recalibrated by an expert. I could not recalibrate it. It was out of touch with reality. As we have seen in this passage of Scripture, Jesus' disciples have a similar problem. They have a hope which is out of touch with reality. They, according to Luke 19.11, supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. But that wasn't happening, nor was it going to happen. This was a big deal for them because they had, think what they had done. They had given up their life for three years to follow Jesus on the assumption that this is where it would all end up. And it wasn't going to end up there. Nevertheless, it was going to end up somewhere that would be good, that would be in line with the plan of God, and so in this great Olivet Discourse, the longest discourse that Jesus gives on the future prophetically, uh, 
uh, that continues through the end of this chapter, he gives a recalibration to their hopes. He resets expectations. So we've seen the last couple of weeks, we saw, first of all, in this passage, the reach for hope in verse 5, the appeal that the disciples made as they felt the ground crumbling under them to what they had always known as the center of existence, the temple, the place where God meets man. But that reach for hope was repudiated by Christ in verse 6, where he informs them, by the way, that temple that you're looking at, so beautiful and so stable and permanent, it's going away. It's not going to be one stone left on top of another. That is not the place to look for hope. And so in verse 7, we saw that they reapply for hope by saying, okay, if that's not it, then Jesus, we, just, we give it to you. What is the right way to think about this? They do that in the form of three questions, which we found in Matthew 24. You may want to turn there because we're going to spend a significant amount of time there this morning. Matthew 24, Matthew's account of this same passage, where they ask in verse 3, tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They know nothing about Jesus going anywhere at this point in time, and so they certainly don't have any concept of him coming again, a second coming such as we do when we read that question. So what were they asking? Well, they were asking, when are you going to come officially as the Messiah of Israel? Because we know you are, so when are you going to act like it? When are you going to set up the kingdom? They really looked at these three things, the destruction of the temple, the coming of the end of the age, and the coming of Christ as being basically simultaneously happening. So Jesus has to clarify in detail. Now, most of the rest of this passage, then, verses 8 through 33, Jesus gives them a reorientation of their hope, a reorientation of hope. And in a nutshell, what Jesus is going to say in these verses is this. The temple and Jerusalem are going to be destroyed, number one. Number two, Jesus is going to be gone for an indeterminate period of time, after which he will come again. But the fact that he's going to be gone shows that the destruction of the temple and his second coming are, in fact, two separate and distinct events. So thirdly, he will come again in an unmistakable way. And fourthly, whereas his first coming was a coming of grace, in a sense, it was his coming to prepare the way for eternal life, for the forgiveness of sins, the cleansing of hearts for everyone who would turn their life over to him. And, and at the same time, provide the entrance requirement to the kingdom, which is what? A changed heart. He really provided the spiritual element of the kingdom, which is an important part right then and there in his first coming. But that's different than the second coming when he will come to judge unbelievers, and then to establish both the spiritual and the physical elements of the kingdom at the same time. That's the passage in a nutshell. So the disciples' expectations were not really wrong with regard to content, but they were certainly wrong as to timing. It needed to be Recalibrated. They could never have imagined a 2,000-plus-year church age such as we've already experienced. They didn't realize they would be the founders of something completely new, this church. So the need for recalibration of their hope and their expectations was very high. Now, as we've seen, none of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, who speak to this, who, who give a, an account of this uh, sermon, none of, none of them give the whole thing. Matthew and Mark primarily address Jesus' answer to the second two questions, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age, so they're dealing with things that are future even to us. Luke is primarily dealing with the answer to the first question, when will these things be, meaning the destruction of the temple. But since that event is a forerunner to or precursor to a worse ultimate judgment, Luke makes some limited 
reference to an intervening age and to the second coming as well. Rejection on the part of Israel, officially rejecting their Messiah, meant delay. <clears throat> and it's going to be a delay characterized by hardship. Persecution during this delayed time will be the norm, not the exception. This intervening age will see many people come to faith in Christ, but it will also see chaotic conditions which continually, continually remind people of the, of the possibility of judgment and of the consequences of rejecting Christ. But in the Father's time, he will come again. Their expectations will be met, just not when, where, and how they thought. It's in God's time. It's in God's way, not in man's way or in man's time. So in verses 5 through 33, then five characteristics of the new age as Jesus resets these expectations. We deal with the first one today. The first characteristic of the new age is going to be a disturbing delay, verses 8 through 11, the ones we read this morning. Now, with regard to those verses, one of the first things we need to understand and that, that we have to try and get in our minds is, well, when exactly are those conditions going to apply? Verses 8 through 11. It was not a pleasant description that we had there of how things are going to be. So when is that going to happen? Verses 12 through 19, and we won't look at those this morning, but when we get there next week, or the two weeks from now, you'll see that verses 12 through 19 clearly define events that will happen to the apostles prior to 70 A.D., prior to the destruction of the temple. But verses 8 through 11 are hardy, harder to pinpoint. The main message, again, is clear. There's going to be a delay characterized by these harsh conditions. Things will be absolutely calamitous at times. But Jesus says in verse 9, don't be terrified. Difficult things are going to come, but don't be terrified. I'm still in charge. God is still in charge. Okay, but we still want to know when. What time period is he referring to? To those events, are they expected to happen between the time that Jesus is speaking and the destruction of the temple in 70 AD? Is that the time period? Are these general characteristics of the age in general, or are these really focusing on the time just prior to the to the second coming of Christ, and is that when these things are kind of telescoped in? All of those answers have been given by different commentators. Now, I'm going to tell you what I think the answer to the question is, and I'm going to give you some reasons why. But I want you to realize that really good, godly people see these things differently. It's impossible to be dogmatic about the timing of some of these things. You may agree or disagree with what I'm going to say this morning. That's okay, just as long as you know the biblical reason why you agree or disagree. But I want you to see the clues that I think are here so that we can see what the timing is. Now, before I even get into that, I want to give some context. At some point, we really need to do this. So I want to give you an overview of, the, of, how the, of how I believe the Bible, what the Bible teaches about eschatology. Eschatology, the study of the end times, or the study of future things. We could kind of look at it either way. Because the Bible definitely has a perspective on those things. And once again, I have to tell you that wonderful, godly people disagree on these. But I'm going to give you a view that's typically called, from a theological standpoint, the premillennial pre-tribulational -tri -pre position. You say, well, that's too many pre's for me. Well, premillennial means that we take seriously the possibility of a thousand-year reign of Christ that's described in Revelation 20, that we believe Jesus will return before that happens and that he will be the one who rules and reigns during that thousand years. We take that literally from that passage of Scripture. I think for one reason, it's mentioned, the, the, the thousand years, the term thousand is mentioned six times in that passage. It's hard to believe that it was intended just as a kind of a throwaway number to represent a long period of time, which is what our amillennial friends believe. They believe we're in the millennium now, 
that this is the thousand year reign of Christ just doesn't happen to be exactly a thousand years. Now again, these are wonderful people, godly people, people I respect and study all the time from their commentaries and so on, but I don't agree with them on that particular part. I believe the Bible clearly shows the premillennial pre-tribulational -tribul view to be the most faithful to a literal grammatical interpretation of the Bible. In other words, you read it the same way as you would any other book. You look for figurative language when it's implied or when it is specifically indicated, but when not, you take it literally. And I defy anyone to read Revelation 19 through 21 without a preconceived notion of a systematic pattern and not see that as a literal presentation. Pretty clear that it is. So that's the view I'll be giving you. Uh, I know we probably have some amillennialists here. I'm sure we do. I've talked to some of you. Uh, don't go away. Just uh, realize we love you. I hope you'll love me back. And um, we'll go through this together. Now, I've given you a diagram on the back of your outline. If you happen to have the books, you don't have that because I didn't have it done at the time we did the books. Uh, there are, however, ones at the back. So at the end of the service today, you can grab one and put it in your book. I think the, it's handy to have if you, for any time, that you might happen to be studying prophecy. So with that in mind, uh, well, here's what it looks like, that little guy. So you can grab one of those in the back if you don't have one. The next prophetic event, you'll see that on this diagram, you'll see that it shows... Uh, Israel, which is basically Old Testament times. Then you see the cross, which is the time of Christ. And then you see this church age that began right after Christ ascended back to be with the Father and so far has extended 2,000 years. We are the church. We're new. Jesus knew all about us, however. If you were to read in Matthew 18, you'd find out that Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I'm sure the disciples are saying, what church? You know anything about a church that period of time. But Jesus did. And Jesus knew what was coming. Jesus always knows what's coming. But we're in the church age, and that will end with, the, with, the, with an event that we call the rapture. The rapture. This is the next event in God's prophetic program. The rapture. It's described, you could call it the first phase of the second coming, although we usually use the second phase of the second coming and call that the second coming just to further confuse you. But the second coming kind of has two phases separated by seven years. The rapture is the first part. It's described in 1 Thessalonians 4. If you can hold your place in, you know, three places, you might want to look there. 1 Thessalonians 4. It's a passage that's very familiar um, to most of us. So let me just read through it, beginning in verse 14. 1 Thessalonians 4. 14. Paul says, and he's writing this because the Thessalonians have gotten all confused about future things. Paul had told them all about future things. He told them Jesus is coming again. These are some of the things that are going to happen, but they got confused. Some of their friends started dying, and Jesus hadn't come again yet, and they're wondering, what happened now? Friends have died. Are they going to be able to be with the Lord? So Paul answers this way. He says, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep, who are dead, in other words. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are, alive, who are alive, who are left, will be caught up. That's where we get the word rapture. The uh, Latin translation, which was used for thousands of years of the New Testament, uses the word raptura. The Latin word is raptura, so we get rapture from that. We'll be caught up together with him in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Now, I want you to notice two key things. There's a whole bunch of things we could note, but I want you to notice two key things today. Number one, Jesus comes in the clouds. There's no indication in this passage that he sets foot all the way on earth. Number one. Number two, 
the saints who are on earth, both dead and alive, don't stay on earth. They go to meet him in the clouds. Okay, so those are two important things to note there. Why? Because seven years later, which we're going to see when we get to Matthew, when Jesus does come again, he comes all the way to earth. He comes and stays, and the people who are on earth don't go to the clouds to meet him. They stay on earth as well. That's why we believe these are two distinct and separate events. Okay, so we have the rapture occurring, and there are other reasons for for believing this that we just don't have time to get into. But the rapture occurs, and that ends the church age. Essentially, God is saying, I'm, I've done what I'm going to do with the church, and I'm taking the church, the believers from this age, home to be with me. It's the end of the church age. We have a church age because Israel rejected their Messiah. And when they rejected their Messiah, God stopped a time clock that he had started for them to deal with them and created this new entity called the church. But that ends when he's ready to deal specifically with Israel as an entity again, which he is about to do just after the rapture happens. So no prophetic event remains to be completed before the rapture could happen. It could happen today. I would pray that it will happen today. Even so, come Lord Jesus. John closed his book of Revelation, right? He was ready. And if he was ready, how much more should we be ready? The rapture could happen any time, beloved. This all goes back to some of the parables that Jesus taught, which taught that the, 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 the coming of Christ could be imminent. This is before he's even gone away. He's teaching them, be ready. You remember that how in Matthew 20, he had the, the virgins who were there, and some of them had oil and some of them didn't, and they weren't ready. He says, I'll come like a thief in the night. So all of these things fit into this rapture. It can happen anytime. So after the rapture, we have this period called the tribulation. A period of time called the tribulation. God returns, or God turns his attention from the church to Israel as a nation and seven years of tribulation follow. Where do we get that? Where do we get that? Or if you were with us a, a couple weeks ago, we talked about Daniel 9, verses 24 through 27. Very critical verses to all of the prophetic plans of God. Daniel 9, 24 through 27. And we saw there that God has defined, he defined to Daniel, the history of the nation of Israel, basically. And he said, here's what's going to happen until I make an end to sin, atonement for sin, and an end to transgression, and so on. He's going to end all of those things. But he said there's going to be seven periods, uh, 70 periods of seven years each to define this. So in other words, 490 years are going to happen. And he said 483 of those years, there's going to be a Messiah on earth, but he's going to be cut off. That's all in Daniel 9. 24 through 27, 483 years, and Messiah will be cut off. 483 years after the Persian king Artaxerxes issued an edict that said the captive Israels, the Israelites who had been captive and taken to Babylon, could go back and rebuild the city. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. What God prophesied to Daniel 600 years before the event happened exactly the way he said 483 years happened between the issuing of the edict of Artaxerxes until Jesus was on earth, and then he was cut off. But because Israel had rejected him in the meantime, the last period of seven years didn't happen. The time clock stopped, and the church age intervened. Now, why did God do it that way? I don't know. You can ask him someday, right? I don't know. But that's what God chose to do. I know part of it is, from Romans 9 through 11, he created the church in order to provoke Israel to jealousy. The day's going to come when Israel's going to look at the church and say, wow, those people love God and God seems to be prospering them and they will be jealous and then they will come to faith in Christ. But it's going to take some time to do that. So the prophetic clock stopped, and the rapture signals the restarting of that time when God will deal with Israel. 
So seven years of tribulation follow. They're all described in Revelation 6 through 18. Now the tribulation itself is divided into two pretty distinct periods as well. Three and a half years each. Half the period of time. It's called in different places in the Bible, sometimes three and a half years, sometimes 42 months, sometimes 1260 days, sometimes time, times, and a half a time. You'll find all of those references in different places in the Bible describing the latter half of this seven years of tribulation. Chaos will reign throughout the whole period of seven years, but it will intensify exponentially in the latter half of that time. Why? Well, turn with me to Daniel 9, and we'll see the answer to that question. Daniel chapter 9, and we're going to deal with verse um, 27, the last one in that little prophetic section. Daniel 9, verse 27. Gabriel is, the angel is talking to Daniel, explaining what's going to happen. And he says this, and he, and if you go back in those verses, you'll find that he is referred to as the prince who is to come there. Other places he's referred to as the Antichrist, sometimes the man of lawlessness, sometimes the beast. This is an end time ruler that the Bible refers to by various terms throughout the Bible. And here he's just referenced, he says, And he will make a strong covenant with many, that is, with Israel, for one week. In other words, the last week, the last period of sevens, the last period of seven years, he's going to make a strong covenant. And for half of the week, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Okay, that seems like strange language to our ears, right? But what it means is this. Antichrist, this end-time ruler who is against Christ, will make a seven-year pact at the beginning of this time with Israel. Say, I'll take care of you guys. I'll keep you safe. But in the middle of the tribulation, he will break that pact. Other passages of Scripture kind of give us some hint as to why he may do this. We won't get into that today. But he will break his covenant. He will actually come to Israel. And we know he'll do this. He will stop the Jewish sacrifices which have begun again in a new temple. There's no temple there today. But they could build one virtually overnight. The plans have been in place since they became a nation again in 1948. So much of prophecy we can see happening right almost before our eyes because nation becoming, uh, Israel becoming a nation is such a, a big thing. It has to be there in order for this to happen, and one day there will be another temple there. They will issue sacrifices. They'll begin a sacrificial system. I assume they build it, if not before the tribulation starts, then during the first part of this tribulation, and they're offering sacrifices by the middle of it. And this guy will come in. He'll stop the sacrifices, and he'll set himself up in the temple to be worshipped as God. You say, where do you get that fantastic statement? Second Thessalonians 2, right? You knew it was going to be in the Bible somewhere, right? It is. Second Thessalonians 2. There, Paul tells the Thessalonians this, that the one who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God, this is the lawless one he's called there, the Antichrist, same one, poses himself and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Does that take a lot of arrogance or what? But that's what this guy is going to do. He's going to set himself up in the temple to be worshipped. And Daniel calls this an abomination. You can see why this would be abominable to the Jewish people, right? It's an abomination to them. And it's an abomination that desolates, meaning they're now left desolate. They don't have a way to worship in accordance with the way they think worship should be carried on. This guy has taken everything away from them. So it's an abomination of desolations that has come upon them. And that's the word Daniel uses. Daniel uses. 
the last three and a half years of this tribulation period are going to be like nothing the world has ever seen before. Now, finally, Daniel, uh, not Ma Daniel, Matthew 24. Let's go there. Matthew 24. With that background, when I go to Matthew 24, his version of this Olivet Discourse, and let's jump in at verse 15. Watch this. Jesus says, so when you see, Matthew 24, 15, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. And if you've just read the passages of Scripture that we just read, you ought to understand. This guy's going to set himself up in the temple to be worshipped as though he were God. Then Jesus says, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. In other words, it's about to get really, really tough. So here's the point of all of this. From Daniel 9, we know that this happens in the middle of the seven years of tribulation, right? It happens right in the middle, three and a half years in. So we can put a time frame on Matthew 24, verse 15. We know that Matthew 24, 15 this abomination of desolation is happening in the middle of this seven years of tribulation, three and a half years in. We have a time frame now, okay? Now, with that in mind, we can work backwards to a couple of other time references in what Matthew gives us. So let's go back to verse 5. Verse 5 of Matthew 24. Now, watch this. Jesus says, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, so that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end of it is not yet. But nations will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, be famines, earthquakes in various places. Where have you heard that before? We just read it in Luke, didn't we? It's the exact same wording that comes from Luke. But what we know is, Jesus is going to move to the middle of the tribulation in verse 15. So what is this that he's doing here? It's the same list as we find in Luke. But Matthew adds one thing in verse 8. Look at that. All these are but the beginning of birth pangs. This is just the start of things, he's saying. This is not the end. This is the start. Now look at verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Notice the word tribulation. I think verse 9 then is the start of the seven-year period of time. Verse 15 has moved to the middle of the tribulation, of the middle of the seven-year period of time. So verses 5 through 8 must be general signs of the age in general. These are the beginning of birth pangs. By the time we get to verse 9, the birth has actually happened. And the tribulation has begun. This section ends at verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end of the age will come. Remember, Jesus is answering the question about the end of the age. So he's basically taking them uh, on a journey from beginning to end, beginning of birth pangs, through the birth of the tribulation period, and then to the end. Now, two more times, Jesus uses the word tribulation in Matthew 24. How are you doing? You still with me, or have I lost you somewhere along the line? Still there? All right, two more times in verse 21. Verse 21, For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been seen since the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. I think this is Jesus referring to the last half of the tribulation that he started in verse 15. He's referring to it as the great tribulation. That's why we use that term usually to apply to the second half of the tribulation, that's the great tribulation because that's going to be a time when things are really turned topsy-turvy. And then during, uh, just jump down to verse 29, his second use of the word tribulation. He says there immediately after the tribulation. Immediately after 
the tribulation of these days. Guess what happens? Verse 30, Jesus comes again. So now we've reached the end of the tribulation. So it seems really clear that Jesus is referring to Daniel's 70th week here by the term tribulation, and he's referring to the last half of it as the great tribulation. So what's going on here, just you know, try and clarify this and pull this together in your mind. In Matthew 24, I think what Jesus is doing in verses 5 through 8 giving general signs of the whole church age, from Pentecost to the rapture, from Pentecost to the rapture, general signs of the whole church age. Beginning in verse 9 through verse 14, the tribulation in general, tribulation in general, verses 15 through 28, the latter half of the tribulation, the great tribulation, the time when things really Come unglued. So Matthew, in other words, is giving us a more or less chronological view of what Jesus is saying in the Olivet Discourse. All right, with that, let's go back now to Luke 21. Let's go back to Luke 21. And what, what was in verses 5 through 8 of Matthew 24 is basically in verses 8 through 11 of Luke 21. So is Luke 21, 8 through 11, is it describing the time between Jesus speaking and the time of the destruction of the temple? Is it speaking of general characteristics of the age, or is it speaking of those period of time really close to the end? I think it's speaking of general characteristics of the age. That same language is pulled out of Matthew 24, where it seems like that's what it's doing. So I think we can bring it over here to Luke 21 and say verses 8 through 11 are talking about the church age in general. This is further shown, if you look at verse 9 of Luke 21, Jesus says, And when you hear wars and tumults, do not be terrified, for these things must take place, but the end will not be yet, will not be at once. So these things are going to happen, but they don't signal the end. End here would refer to end of the age. This is not the end of the age things. These are general characteristics of the age in general. This is the church age. And the main message here that Jesus is giving to his disciples is, guys, guess what? There's a delay. There's a delay. And it's not going to be fun. It's going to be an e-ticket ride. You don't know what an e-ticket ride is, do you? Disneyland, years ago when they first opened, you didn't just pay one price and you could ride on anything. You got A, B, C, D, and e-tickets. And the e-ones were for the, you know, the most exotic rides. This is an e-ticket ride. Jesus says, that's what's going to happen. You think you're going to get kingdom, you're going to get chaos. That's a fairly substantial reset of expectations, isn't it? But that's what he's telling them. So don't be surprised. Don't be worried about it. Don't be terrified about it. It's going to be a tough ride. And then he gets some characteristics. So let's look at this and see, does this really fit with the age we live in? It says they're going to be false messiahs. Don't go after them. Been any false messiahs around? A lot of them, right? Jewish history is filled with false messiahs. Thutis was one. 44 AD, Thutis came. In fact, you can find him in Acts 5, verse 38. He was famous enough that he got into the book of Acts, which was written a little later. Thutis came along, claimed to be a messiah, promised to part the Jordan River, Jordan River didn't cooperate. Rome caught up with him. They killed him and 400 of the people who were following him. Apparently not the Messiah. Simon Bar Kokhba came along in the second century. He got a great following of about 5,000 5, people that the Romans killed when he rebelled against them. 1648 A.D., a guy named Shabbatai Zvi came along. He got a huge following in Palestine. But he was captured by the Muslims. Remember, they were in, in charge in Palestine by that time. They captured him. And uh, this particular Messiah converted to Islam on pain of death. So probably not the Messiah. But he came along saying he was. And many others. I mean, in our own day, we've had people claiming to be Messiah or to be a Christ or something, right? Jim Jones or David Koresh or Sun Moon. There's always somebody 
Our age has been characterized by false messiahs. Should it be a surprise? No. The only surprise would be if there isn't one on the horizon. Jesus said this is one thing that will characterize your age. But he says when you see these false messiahs, or, you know, they, they come in other forms too. They come in guys writing books saying this is when Jesus is going to come again. This is when it's going to all happen. You know, from the Millerites in the 1840s till Harold Camping in 2014 in the Mayas in whatever year they were. So Jesus is going to come, and this is when it's going to be the end. Jesus says what? Don't go after them. Don't be fooled. I've always said anybody that gives you a date, you know, if Jesus said as he's leaving, which he did in Acts 1.8, it is not for you to know the times and the seasons. If anybody gives me a date, the only thing I know for sure is that's probably a day Jesus isn't coming again, right? That's the only thing I know for sure. I don't know the time, and neither does anybody else. Think how many times in history, and I think in some sort of way back, I gave you a whole bunch of these, but think how many times in history somebody said, this one is going to happen, 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 and it never happens. It'll happen in God's time. It'll happen when we least expect it. He will come as a thief in the night. Well, what does he say to us? Be faithful. Don't go after them. Just be faithful. Be faithful to me. Trust me. This is what's going to happen. So there'll be false messiahs. Verse 9, Luke 21, there will be wars. Do we live in an age that's characterized by wars? Somebody estimated that there were 50 significant wars in the first thousand years after Christ said this. Fifty. In the thousand years between then and now, there have been 850 significant wars. And 800 of those have happened since 1800. What does that tell you? Well, it tells you that the wars are getting more numerous, they're getting deadlier, and they're coming with less time in between. We had a war to end all wars in World War I, right? Peace lasted 20 years. We live in an age of war. Until the heart is changed, war is inevitable. Will Durant, you know, the famous historian that wrote that multi-volume history of Western civilization, he said this, he said, War is one of the constants of history and has not diminished with civilization, with, with civilization and democracy in the last 3,421 years. Only 268 have seen no war. Let me read that again. In the last 3,421 years, only 268 have seen no war. It's easy to think war means the end, doesn't it? I mean, you're right in the middle of it. It seems like nothing worse could possibly happen. But Jesus' advice is don't be terrified because these things must take place, but the end will not be at once. War takes a huge toll. War is the norm, not the exception in the age in which we come. But war will not bring the end of the age. Jesus will. Right? Jesus will. War is just a characteristic. Verse 11, Luke 21, he says, There are going to be famines, earthquakes, pestilences, terrors, and great signs from heaven. Terrors. I mean, how many of those do we have these days, right? Ones that... They couldn't have even enumerated in those days deadly fires they could have talked about, but nuclear accidents, terrorist attacks. We're getting firsthand experience in all of these. Great signs from heaven will become catastrophic worldwide during the tribulation as described in Revelation 6 through 19. I mean, some of the things there you're, you'll be amazed at. You'll say, how could the universe still function and this all happen? Only because God can do whatever God chooses to do. But we get hints in this age with tornadoes and earthquakes and volcanoes and tidal waves. And you know, we could list how many of them have happened. According to, why, do, why do those happen? You know what? According to Luke 18, they happen for this reason. They happen to try to turn rebellious men back to God. Right? That's why catastrophes happen. The message is, you, mankind, are not in charge of your own destiny. I am. 
That's what God's trying to say. And then Jesus in Luke 18 says, so repent so that you do not likewise perish. So how do we conclude this today? Well, let me conclude this way. Jesus is telling the disciples, he's setting expectations, phase one, where they're expecting a kingdom, they're going to get delay. It's going to be a chaotic, disturbing delay, but Jesus knows it. Jesus can even predict it. Jesus can tell what it's going to be like. And so he says in verse 19, jump down to 19 of Luke 21, by your endurance, you will gain your lives. There's the key. Hang in. Keep the faith. Don't despair. Whatever you're seeing, whatever is coming your way, things may not be happening the way you expected. They may not be happening the way you expected in life in general. They may not be happening the way you expected in the culture. They may not be happening the way you expect in your personal life. What do you do? Endure. Keep the faith. God is still in charge. He's in charge enough that he could predict this is what it's going to be, and he will predict, and he will bring it to an end when he decides to bring it to an end. It's the same message we all need, right? For, for 2,000 years, this has been going on, and we keep asking, when is he coming? And the answer is, soon. Soon. Jesus is coming soon. You say, well, 2,000 years doesn't seem soon. Peter had the answer to that. He said, I know you've been expecting. You, they were laughing at Peter when it had only been, what, a few years. And they said, where's your God that's going to come? Peter said, well, I think you misunderstand. One day with the Lord is like 1,000 years. It hasn't even been five minutes at that point in time, right? Today we could say, well, it's been a couple days. Jesus is coming soon, beloved. Coming soon. Thank God he's coming soon and we're on the winning side, so keep the faith, endure. Gain your life by giving it whatever he asks, whatever he requires. I love this little story. That they were building the, you know, the Panama Canal and it took, turned out, as those of you who've read the history know, a lot more difficult than anybody thought it was going to be. Criticism against George Washington Gothels, who was in charge, grew absolutely fierce. They were calling him all kinds of names. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was rough. A colleague asked him finally, aren't you going to answer your critics? He said, in time. And the guy said, but when? He said, when the canal is finished. That's the answer. That's the same answer Jesus has, beloved. When's he going to answer all the critics? When he comes again. And when will he do that? When he decides the time is right. God is in charge. He came the first time. He will come again. Don't worry. Endure. In the end, Jesus wins. And all those who are on his side. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this assurance. Um, Lord, if we, if we get some of the details wrong at times, the main message is really clear. You know everything that's going to happen. You are fully in charge of everything that is happening, not only in the world at large, but in our own individual lives. So easy, Father, when we get those wrong words, it's cancer. It's, it's a heart attack. Don't know if we can do anything. So easy to despair. Lord, this is the same Lord that was in charge then, that's in charge now. It says, not a hair of your head will be harmed. And then as we'll see in the very next verse, he says, some of you will die for my sake. How can you die and not have a hair harmed? By being a follower of Jesus Christ, when to die means to be with the Lord. That's how. So may we not despair. May we be faithful. Thank you, Father, for this word. Thank you for the assurance that we have in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.